the bell for a second here. Okay. Would you tell me again when was the most important thing? Yes, so we need to be walking out of the room at 10.15. Okay, fine. And there's a fine. clock just over that. Okay, well, yeah, I'm going to That's yep. great. Thank you. And as much as you want to do with questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, friends, if you, could, uh, if you could head for your seats, we'll begin in just a second, please. If you'll head for your seats. There are handouts on the back, two chairs back there. Oh, yes, we have, we have some handouts, and I just added some more if we were running low. Thank you. This is wonderful. We're coming back. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Church of the Holy Communion for our adult forum this morning. A special welcome to those of us who are joining us uh, online today. We don't always have live streaming for the adult forum, but when we have guest speakers in, we like to make that possible. So a special greeting to those of you gathering online this morning as well. Uh, yesterday, we celebrated the ordination of Sarah Cowan, a former member of this parish, to the Sacred Order of the Priesthood. It was a wonderful celebration, uh, which is archived on our Facebook page and website if anyone would like to go back and take a look at it. Um, the preacher for the occasion has graciously agreed to stay over uh, today to speak in the forum and preach for us on this last Sunday of Epiphany. I'm just so delighted to introduce the Reverend Dr. Kathy Grebe, Professor of New Testament Emerita at Virginia Theological Seminary, Director of the Center for Anglican Communion Studies, and a personal friend and mentor to all three of the resident priests of this congregation. Kathy, we're so glad to have so you lovely. back at Holy Communion. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for your warm greeting yesterday and today. Um, it is when we ordain a, a, someone to the diaconate or the priesthood or the episcopate for that matter, it, the whole church is blessed, um, and so we were right to celebrate like mad yesterday. But as I thought about preparing for this forum today, I real, you know, only a small percentage of, of, of people, it took Sarah, by the way, years and years and years to get to that place where we, where we finally arrived yesterday. Um, but it, but um, what about the rest of God's holy people? Um, and so I, I thought, it, today might be a good day for us to focus on gifts and on vocation and on uh, nurturing spiritual gifts in this community, just recognizing that all of us are beloved children of God um, and that we are given the uh, gift of the Holy Spirit in our baptism and that we sometimes spend the rest of our life figuring out exactly how we're to use those gifts we are given. Um, we grow in grace, we grow in, in favor with God, um, and we, I think we grow better and more clearly if we're thinking about it. So that's my invitation to you today is just to, 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 just to let what I'm saying just go, just go by and um, this is not something you have to learn or memorize, just something to th listen to and, and think about for yourself and your own your own vocation, your own walk with God, the journey that God is bringing you on specifically. Um, or alternatively, or actually both, think about the people around you and particularly young, the young people around you and where you might be called to be an Eli to some young Samuel or an Elizabeth to some young Mary. Um, so we'll talk about those stories in a minute, but um, there's a, a, a very important vocation of mentoring and supporting uh, younger, the next generation. Um, it was William Temple who said that the church is always only the church because it's not a hereditary thing. Everybody in the church has to, uh, to sign up to be, to be there. Um, the church is always only one generation away from extinction. So it really matters whether we take up the the, the task of supporting our young people and mentoring them, growing them into the, the multitude of roles and vocations that, that God uh, calls us to. So that's, that's the, my the rationale for the forum today, and I hope it'll be helpful to you. Um, so some biblical reflections on vocation, vision, and nurturing spiritual gifts and visions. Um, starting with the quotation from Proverbs, where there is no vision, the people perish. And then um, I think that for me, the next place to go is Pentecost, uh, because we are talking about gifts of the Holy Spirit. 
And you'll remember that on Pentecost, Peter is preaching to the people, um, but they have some, some of them have some doubts about all this stuff that's going on, people speaking in foreign languages, and, and the scoffers say, oh, they've just had too much new wine. Peter says, hey, it's nine o'clock in the morning. Uh, nobody gets drunk at nine o'clock. This isn't about being drunk. This is what Joel, the prophet Joel predicted. And so we, we get a biblical flashback to Joel too. Peter says, this is what it is. Indeed, we're not drunk. Those are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy." So the, the idea um, that the Holy Spirit pour, pours out gifts, not just on clergy, not just on one or two people uh, who are in a, in a designated leadership position, but at, on everybody, everybody uh, has gifts of the Spirit. And that's, uh, that's the church's charter, the church's birthday party, and the understanding of what it means to be church is a people gathered in the power of the, the Holy Spirit um, to receive and share the gifts of the Spirit with one another. Uh, ment go back to mentoring for a minute. Let's go back to first the story in, of the call of Samuel. Um, I'm going to flip back to remind, just so I have the words in front of me, but you can look it up later. We won't, I won't do the whole story. It takes too long. We won't get to say and hear from one another everything else we want to say. But um, the, the way the story starts is important. The boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli, the word of the Lord was rare in those days, and visions were not widespread. And that's when God acted. <laughs> At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim, vision, no vision in those days, right? So that he could not see, in case we didn't get the first three references, <laughs> uh, lying down in the room. The lamp of God had not quite gone out. Um, the, the, the congregation, the, the people of the, of the Lord were not hearing the word of the Lord. It was not a good time for them. Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, young Samuel, where the ark of the God was. And the Lord said, Samuel, Samuel, he said, here I am. And ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. And Eli said, I didn't call you. Go lie down again, go back to sleep. This happened three times, and finally it dawned on Eli, since he didn't have much vision, he couldn't see, it took three times for God to get through. And, and Eli said, you, next time, go, you go back and lie down, and when he calls you again, you say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And so if, if, if Eli hadn't been, had enough vision left and enough of, of his of understanding of God left, it might be that we never would have had the prophet Samuel. And the, but the whole story, I mean, this is, this is the book of 1 Samuel, and there's a second Samuel. Samuel has a long, uh, a long, important, very important career as a prophet. But it starts there. Um, it starts when Eli tells him how to listen to the Lord. So vocational and calling is always situational and specific. And one definition of a vocation or a call, I think this belongs to Frederick Buechner, but I'm not positive, where something I want to do or give connects with a place of need or sorrow in the world. You see the two-sidedness of that, something that I feel in me needs to be done and that I can do, and I see a need, something that needs to be done, a place that's, that could, where somebody, if somebody stepped in and acted, it would make a difference. That's, that's, that's the, the two-sidedness of a call or vocation. Um, but it's not always a clear call the way it seems to have been for Samuel. Um, often uh, vocation and calling is sneakier than that. Um, so when I find myself at, at it, just for example, at, at, at bored or restless at my job, um, it may be time to, it may be a signal that it's time to find another job. Does God want people to be bored? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, so. So when we find ourselves to see, 
um, restless or, or unhappy or frustrated consistently, it, a sense that things aren't right, that I'm not in the right place, I'm not spending my time the right way, uh, frustration that things never change, it may be time for a change. It might be that God is, is, um, is sending us signals, the Holy, that the Holy Spirit is prompting us to consider, are we really in the place where we're meant to be? Am I in the place where I can do the most good? If I'm frustrated all the time, maybe not. Um, these are matters for discernment. It's not, it's not like, oh, I'm bored today, I'm gonna quit. It's not like that. It's, a, it's just that the question is raised. The question suddenly gets on the table and we start thinking about it. Um, we start thinking about where, whether we're in the right place. A vocation or a calling is inevitably communal and it's for the common good. It isn't just there are two, those two sides where there's a place that's hurting in the world um, and, and a place of need or sorrow and I want to give something. Um, it, it, so it needs to be tested within the community. Um, I, I can't, uh, I don't, I, none of us can really trust ourselves to, to, be, to see from God's point of view. We don't see from God's point of view. Uh, we see from our own point of view and sometimes that's interested I mean, in the sense that we're prejudiced for our own good or sometimes prejudiced against our own good. Um, and that's why we need each other. We need to test vocations and calls with other people. Um, I, I think, um, wouldn't it be a good idea if somebody did this? Well, yeah, maybe, maybe I'm the person to do this. Yes, you would be the, a good person to do this. Your, your gifts and skills match this need uh, that the church has or that the world has. Not all, I don't want to get, ever give the impression that all the ministry or, or the, um, the gifts for ministry happen inside of the church building. Um, God is working in the, in the world. Um, and the, uh, sometimes the most important, you'll see from some of my examples later on, um, some of the most important calls and vocations that have ever happened had, I won't say nothing to do with the church, but uh, the church is not the, the place, not the venue where they're acted out. So we're not, I'm not talking um, specifically about uh, serving in some role in the church building on Sunday morning. That's not really what I'm thinking about here, as valuable as that is. But vision and vocation are closely linked. So I've given you some more proverbs um, about that. Poor eyes limit your sight, poor vision limits your deeds. Only the person who can see the invisible can do the impossible, I like that one. Um, I mean, it, you know, sometimes the most real things are the things we can't see. The thing that most needs doing is the thing that everybody says is impossible. Vision is the art of seeing things that are invisible. And Margaret Mead, never doubt that a few deeply committed people can change the world. It's the only thing that ever has changed the world. Um, again, let's look at uh, the, vis the visitation of, of uh, Mary to Elizabeth. Um, and, and understand that story in terms of vocation. This is where Mary, Mary um, sings her Magnificat at the end of it, but she doesn't get there right away. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country. She entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her, leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's Luke's language for, um, for power and prophecy and vision. Um, that just that this happens again and again in this, in this wonderful narrative. And Elizabeth exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Elizabeth, we know from the, the context that I didn't read you, is a, a much older woman. And Mary is a very young woman, probably a teenager. So this is again an example of um, someone who, who knows the ways of the Lord for, and has known them for a long time, helping a younger woman to trust that what has happened to her, the, the vision, um, the, the visit of Gabriel and, the, and her pregnancy is of God and is a holy thing and is 
um, uh, to be celebrated and uh, when Elizabeth says the mother of my Lord, it's this language that doesn't rock us particularly. We know Jesus Christ is Lord is the oldest co confession of the church, but it's, a, it's an amazing statement for one woman to say to another in this context. So Elizabeth is speaking as a prophet, um, and then Mary sounds very much like a prophet when she says her Magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Um, the mighty one has done great things for me, holy is his name. He has shown strength with his arms, scattered the proud, brought down the powerful from their thrones, lifted up the lowly, filled the hungry with good things, and sent the rich away empty, served his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy and his promises. Um, so sometimes it takes another person to say the thing that we think we might be called to, or sometimes to tell us that we have gifts that we don't even know we have. Um, some churches have discernment committees, um, where, where, whether it's formal or not, where people sort of consciously think together about the gifts of the Spirit and try to identify those gifts in other people. Some gifts are easily spotted. Um, not everybody can, can play the organ or, or sing in the choir. Um, you gen, if you have that gift, you tend to know it. Um, it's so valuable, you immediately get impressed into service. Um, but there are other, other gifts, lifts, gifts like listening, um, gifts um, like showing up. Um, you know, somebody said 90% of life is showing up. A, a, a community doesn't work if people don't, don't come and invest um, and so the, the ministry of being there for one another, uh, being there at key times, weddings and funerals and baptisms, is an important ministry. And some people are, are, hear that as a call and a vocation more strongly than others. It's a, and thank God they do. Uh, what would it be like if, if sort of nobody, nobody came? You know? um, sometimes our bodies, this story tells us also, sometimes our bodies know we're being called to something before our minds get it. Um, we can feel uh, excitement. We notice that we're excited about something, that we get, that we're happy when we're, when we're doing a particular thing. Um, I actually like washing dishes. I know that's weird, but I think, uh, so um, I have a dishwasher that I never use because I enjoy washing dishes. I don't know why, um, but um, it's something that is fun for me. And I know that it's not fun for other people, um, we're interestingly different that way. So we can tell when we're, when we're excited about something, when we enjoy something, when something we do makes us happy, um, and when it makes other people happy when we do something. Those are all signs um, of, a, of a calling or a vocation. Um, I'm, I've used some examples that are trivial, but sometimes vocation or vision um, takes is something much more uh, powerful and complicated. If you're the only one in a, in a work situation who is not doing something crooked and you call other people on it, you can lose your job for that. You, know, you all know that. Uh, somebody said the most important thing to know about a job is how to get fired. Um, if you know where the lines are, then you have a little more freedom to skate uh, around in and out around close to the line, but not quite over it. Um, but sometimes you need to go right over that line and out the door if, if what, what's going on around you is, is not, not truthful. So if it takes courage to speak a vision, we can provide encouragement to one another. We give one another courage to do the right thing. Ludwig, Ludwig Wittgenstein, 20th century philosopher, said the most important gift one philosopher could give to another was to say to him or her, take your time. And I never would have thought of that. Take your time, get, you know, you wanna get it, get it right. Um, we, the most important things do take time. Don't have to rush it, take your time. What a blessing that is to be able to, there's so many situations where I say we can, where we can give people permission uh, not, to, not to rush. There's a, a famous book out now uh, called Thank You for Being Late, <laughs> Thomas Friedman, because we have this, you know, we're so compulsive sometimes about time and, and deadlines. So uh, those are things working. Work. Where, where are we called sometimes to be countercultural, uh, not, to, not to accept what the culture says is the most important, uh, or when it's important to be on time? Uh, these things are worth discerning. 
Nothing that's worth doing is simple. We'll be given what we need and taught how to do it along the way. Uh, we make the path while we're walking it, which is better than making the plane while you're flying it. So, uh, but we can do that. We can do that. Sometimes ne neither of the people involved in a meeting that involves mission have any idea what God is doing. And one example of that is in Acts 10, in the famous uh, meeting of Peter and Cornelius. It takes about five chapters of Acts to really tell this story. Luke loves the story, and so we get it in great detail. Um, but let me just remind you of a couple of, of key points of that story. The most important thing to see is that the Spirit is working both sides of the equation. Um, speak, prompting Cornelius to find Peter, prompting Peter to listen to Cornelius, um, and the, as a result of that, they come together, uh, Gentiles and Jewish Christians, um, in a way, Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians, in a way that that probably wouldn't have happened without that prompting of the Holy Spirit to bring two groups of people who normally wouldn't talk to each other together. Um, so um, I, I commend that story to you. Uh, it's a story about discernment, um, and and that's um, and and sometimes we know that something is of God when you know um, when when it works when it suddenly it shouldn't work but it works. Um, I sometimes pray for seminarians who are trying to decide where they they might be called to work. We pray that God will shut the wrong doors and open the right doors. Um, and and, and they, they, I think they wince when I say shut the wrong doors uh, because that, uh, it's there, at that point they're thinking, I'd like more doors open. Um, but um, I think we need to pray both halves of that um, so that we're, when we're thinking about vision or, or vocation, um, we want to pay attention to when, when things don't feel right or when it would be extremely difficult to do that. It might be that we're not supposed to try. Um, and when all of a sudden what we thought was not going to happen and then all the doors are open and everything, the way is suddenly paved and it's easy, um, maybe that's a sign that we're meant to just go there. It doesn't always have to be hard and difficult. Uh, but not always. Sometimes it takes decades for the vision to be accomplished. And so I remember Monica, the, the mother of St. Augustine, who was a party animal, big time, uh, wine, women, and song, and he loved it, and his famous prayer was, Lord, make me holy, but not yet! I'm having too much fun, and Monica, on the other hand, was praying night and day for her son that he would finally get the religion that he was teaching, um, and he did, of course, um, and he describes his conversion at some length in, uh, in, his, in the book Confessions. If you've never read Augustine's Confessions, it's a good read. I commend it to you, and a lot of fine theology. William Wilberforce, uh, was determined to end the slave trade in England. He didn't actually see it go through Parliament. He presented, I don't know how many times he presented it, presented it, presented it, was voted down, voted down, voted down. And uh, at the very end of his life, I think he had more hope as the numbers finally changed, but he didn't live to see it. It was the generation after him that gave thanks for his long, long struggle to get that done. And in our country, Ida B. Wells, she's um, um, one of the unsung heroes of the, of the, well before the civil rights movement. She was a one woman campaign to end lynching in this country. Um, and she didn't quite end it, but she certainly made it, called it to spotlighted it, um, made it something, made it an issue um, constantly, completely, and finally, um, thanks be to God, that horrible practice is over. And many other examples, um, I, mean, I, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't say that quite yet. We're still working on, on um, justice, um, receiving justice while black is still, still a problem here, but maybe, maybe, maybe it's, not, it's not quite lynching, I don't know, some people would say it is. And many other examples. So I would invite you to think of one from your own context or um, your own uh, family history or your own personal history where where something took a long time to put it right. Um, in Peter's case, he became convinced um, pretty quickly that, that God had already decided the matter and he just had to get in line with what the Spirit was doing. Or he still had to give an account of his decision to the rest of the church. Um, this isn't something, 
on, on major issues like this, it doesn't help for one person to think, you know, the Holy Spirit told me this and so, shh, maverick. Um, again, these things need to be tested and discerned and Peter was called on the carpet for his action until he finally persuaded um, the rest of the church that baptizing um, people who had already received the gift of the Holy Spirit and were speaking in tongues was the right thing to do. Uh, so um, these things are, are, are not simple. They're, they're matters of discernment. Um, we've been talking about stories of, of uh, vision and vocation and discernment, but now I wanna talk a little bit about the theory of it. And for that, I go to Paul and Romans 12 um, and 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, passages that you know. Uh, Romans 12, at the beginning of it, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. When we, when we come before God, we don't just present our offerings, our life and labor before the Lord, we present ourselves. We are a living sacrifice. It's something of a paradox because in the temple, the only the, the animal that was sacrificed was not living anymore. Was it was it had been killed? Was had been slaughtered for sacrifice? So, what is a living sacrifice? Well, Paul calls us to be living sacrifices, made over to God, uh, as if we had no life of our own, except we don't want zombies. We're not, we're not talking about people who are, who um, who have no. We're not puppets of God. Um, but still, when we, when we pray as we sang yesterday, take my life and let it be, we're living into the spirit of Romans 12 where we offer ourselves as a sacrifice, a living sacrifice to the Lord. And we pray to be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we may discern what is the will of God. It's not obvious most of the time what is the will of God. It takes some thinking, some listening, some talking to others, some, some careful discernment. And Paul goes on here, for the, by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Not all the members have the same function. So you, we who are many are one body in Christ and individually we're members one of another. We have gifts that differ. Um, in some in, in proportion to faith ministry, uh, the teacher, the exhorter, uh, in the, in the giver in generosity, the leader, uh, the compassionate, um, and all Christians are to be, to have genuine love, to, are to hate what is evil, to hold fast to what is good, to love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. You're in, you've got to cons competitive spirit, that's a good thing, that's a gift, says Paul. Use that, that sense of competition to, to, um, to, to show honor to God. Um, so Paul goes on in Romans 12, and I commend it to you, but I wouldn't, this wouldn't be a talk about spiritual gifts if we didn't go to 1 Corinthians 12 and, um, and hear this one. Um, now, there are, a variety of gift, there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are uh, activated by one and the same spirit which uh, allots to each one individually just as the spirit chooses. So that we are one body with many members and all the members of the body, though many, are one body. So it is with Christ. In the spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews, Greeks, slaves, free. We were all made to drink of one spirit. So the body doesn't consist of one member, but of many. He talks about both the human body and the body of Christ. If the foot would say, therefore, I'm, I'm not a hand, uh, so I don't belong to the body, 
that wouldn't make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear said, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God has arranged the members of the body, each one of them as God chose. If all were a sim single member, where would the body be? So the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. <laughs> Nor can the head say to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are actually indispensable. Try making it without your liver. <laughs> so um, humans sometimes evaluate gifts on, a, on some kind of a scale. My gift is better than your gift. Um, but God's not very interested in that kind of behavior, says Paul. Um, all the parts of the body are needed. Um, every, every gift is needed and every person is needed in the body of Christ. So we present ourselves to God as a living sacrifice, remembering that we do not belong to ourselves, we belong to the Lord, as Paul says elsewhere, and that gifts given to members of the community are given in a kind of trust for the entire community and for the good, for the common good. Every member of the body of Christ has gifts, is gifted and plays a vital part in the health of the whole body. And gifts come in many forms, many kinds. Time, money, whatever else I have that I can make available to you. My gift of listening, my gift of blessing, my gift of supporting, my gift of laughing, my gift of loving. Uh, all these are gifts that we can give to one another, uh, ways in which we can support one another in, in building up the body um, in love. A gift, however, um, gifts can be like anything else, like any good thing, uh, can be misused. So uh, let's just notice that, a, that a, a gift may not be a gift. It may look like a gift to me, but if I realize later that was a bit manipulative, then I should realize that maybe it, what, wasn't, a, wasn't, it wasn't received as a gift. Um, a gift that I would enjoy giving may or may not be what the church most, most needs from me. Um, I went to Hollins College in, in Roanoke, and um, one, a donor gave to the, to the college a collection of enamel birds um, in, in a connection with a large financial gift on condition that the college had to find, build a room around the, and, and, sh and uh, little cages or, or little uh, pieces of, of wood or something for these enamel birds to be perched on forever. Um, and they made the decision to accept the gift, and now they are stuck with, <laughs> with a room that has to be saved for enamel birds uh, for in perpetuity, because they need to keep their promise, of course. Um, so I, I'm sure that the, that the donor um, meant well, but the donor probably really wanted to see those enamel birds um, kept in perpetuity somewhere, and so um, that's how it worked out. I don't know, I don't wanna judge that, um, but it seems to me that, that we need to think when we give our gifts um, about what we're doing, not just about what we want, but about what we're asking of the person who receives the gift. So um, giving and receiving gifts, including spiritual gifts, is, is an art, it's a skill, and we can, it's something we can grow in. We can grow in, in our ability to give um, to give gifts that are, are helpful. Faith, hope, and especially love are virtues. They are strengths, power, spiritual gifts that guide us in the giving and receiving of gifts from one another. I should also say there's an art to receiving a gift. Um, when someone um, with great thoughtfulness and ability offers me a gift and I say, oh no, thank you, I have done something to that relationship that is hard to fix. So we might wanna think about the gift of receiving someone else's gift. That's, that can be important too. Or recognizing gifts in one another for the good of the whole and the glory of God. Patience may be the most valuable spiritual gift. We could argue about which is the most valuable spiritual gift, but I would think patience would be a real contender in that, I, I still go back to that Wittgenstein quote about, you know, take your time, 
because our culture doesn't give us much permission to be patient with one another. And the school of prayer, that is where we spend time with God alone or with others, is where we're most likely to learn what we need to know about all of this, about vocation or calling, about vision, um, about dreaming dreams, about blessing the dreams of other people, about encouraging people to have big ideas, about encouraging people to try something they've never tried before, about telling people, you're good at that, um, or just um, recognizing you have a real, you have a real gift for that. Um, so that's where we learned, I think, how to do that. And now um, I'm gonna stop talking and, and invite you to um, either, either talk to a neighbor about, about any of that, or uh, maybe we'll take some questions as well. What, what works best, Sandy? Okay, and they are very welcome. Do we have a question from one of them? Uh, not yet, but I will, I will posit any questions, but if you could just restate any questions to which you're responding, that would be helpful. Thank you. Are there questions or comments? Might be some pushback on something I've said, I wouldn't be surprised. They're welcome, that's always welcome. Thank you, Amy, for telling us the story about um, how you personally have experienced a, the sense of having a door that was closed, things that weren't working, that prompted you to volunteer for Habitat for Humanity. And how many years did you say you did that? I've been involved with them for yeah. 20 years. 20 years later, she's, she's grateful that, that that other thing didn't work and that God put her, put you, is that a fair statement? That God brought you to the place you needed to be, where you wanted to give that particular gift. I love Habitat. Um, there, it's, uh, I love the whole idea of, of sweat equity, um, that the people who are most involved in receiving a house have a chance to, to say some, to give back and to have some say in what the house, how the house goes. It's just, it makes all kinds of sense. Oh. oh, that's nice. Once again, God's people need a good carpenter. Yeah, that's a lovely, f f perfect for habitat, right? I wonder if there are other questions or comments. Thank you for that one. Yeah. Um, can you come to a point where, like, say, a parent dies or you're going for a major crisis? Life? Yeah. I know there's a question in there, but I haven't heard, quite heard it yet. What, 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 go ahead and what, finish it. Yeah. What kind of uh, like inner spiritual whisperings, whatever, how do you separate it all out? I think uh, the question is, when you're going through a major life crisis, like losing a parent, that certainly sounds like a major uh, life crisis to me. It was for me. Um, um, how do you, what, how do spiritual gifts relate to that process of just making sense of all of that? I think um, one of the things that helps the most is when we tell each other our stories. Um, I'm always grateful when there is, when it's possible as part of a, a funeral reception afterwards or uh, sometimes in a wake situation before, uh, that when, when we can hear stories about the person who has just died. And often the members of the family learn things about their beloved that they never knew, a, a wonderful thing they'd done for somebody uh, once in a, in, a, in a church camp or something. You, you never, they're just, when, when family and friends get together to talk about someone, um, there's often an opportunity for for sharing those blessings. So, so that's one way I think it happens. But so many of us have had the experience of losing a parent that 
that um, nobody should have to go through it alone. Um, you've got a whole community, and we all do have a whole community of friends here who are uh, available to both anticipate um, your, your mother, your father, um, looks like they're losing some of their powers. Is there any way I can be helpful? Just some, some being aware of the situation of other people is so helpful. And, and then the person involved, most involved can say, well, not yet, but I may call you one of these days and needs, you know, you know my number. That just that availability by, you know, I'm ready to be there and back you up can be a huge help to somebody. Don't, you haven't done anything yet. <laughs> um, and maybe at the, at the time it works out that you don't accept you're there. Just being there for someone may be one of the most important gifts we can give. Other thoughts, or how are we doing on, on time? Uh, well, okay, good. Uh, Lots of time. One of our online friends asks, how can we balance being a living sacrifice with self-care? Burnout feels like a real danger, as does losing one's sense of self and living for everyone else all the time. Yeah, oh man. Um, I, um, I'm always reminded of the, the uh, airplane message about when you have to, when you pull down the oxygen mask, uh, put your own mask on before helping others. Have you, some of you heard that? I mean, it may be a long time since you've been on a plane, <laughs> but you might re still remember that. And I think the reason why is because um, if we don't have enough oxygen ourselves, we're likely to faint and not be much help to anybody around us. Um, so, um, and some of you heard me um, Warn as part of a charge, uh, Sarah Cowan yesterday to to while she's caring for everybody else to to do make sure that she's caring for herself to take her day off, get her medical checkups, all that. Give her a whole long list of things um, that she should be be doing. Um, it's quite possible for um, for, uh, for burnout is real. Uh, burnout is real, particularly for activists, people, because there's always more to, more you could do, um, and because the problems of the world don't seem to stop. Um, if you if there if you ha are committed to to feeding the hungry, there's going to be another hungry person immediately, um, and then another one after that, and another one after that. And we see um, we see even Jesus of Nazareth struggling sometimes to to uh, feed um, you know, 5,000 people, 4,000 people. Um, and, and so often, it, it, especially in Luke, Jesus goes off and takes some time to pray, to be re-energized, to, um, to, to renew uh, his, his uh, relationship with God, uh, which he does again, by the way, right before the, the, his t the time on the cross. Um, uh, he knows that it's gonna take everything he has to, to um, to go through that ordeal. And so he spends time in prayer beforehand. Um, this is wisdom to know our limits and also wisdom to trust God. We are not God. Um, and so we are not expected to be God and to solve all the problems of the world and fix everything. Um, we are expected to do s some things, to do what we can, um, to do some good in the world. Um, it would be horrible, I think, to, to, to be at the end of my life and think I never did anything good for anybody ever. Um, but it would also be fantasy island if I thought I, at the end of my life, well, I solved all the problems of the world, um, and uh, yeah, that's just not realistic. So we're always going to fall short. Um, I, had, I remember Bishop Bill Spofford saying every time we give an offering, it's always a lousy offering meaning that we never, we, we never give fully of ourselves. We never, we, when we pray, we, we, I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved my neighbor as myself. Um, so we, we just have to keep confessing that. Um, but at the same time, we shouldn't try to do, we shouldn't try to be God. We shouldn't try to save the world. It's, it's actually been done. Um, so we don't, we don't need uh, to uh, enjoy some kind of a fantasy about being the Messiah. I think there's even a name for this, a Messiah complex. It leads to burnout pretty quickly. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Question, comment.
Rachel Carson. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that. The climate, the situation of the climate and the, uh, the warming of the earth, and we're now, we are definitely reaping the consequences of, um, of the blindness and deafness of, an, of earlier generations, and we better be careful that there's some earth left uh, for the people who come after us. The, it's not surprising that it's uh, young people, uh, people 13, 14, 15, that are being most vocal about the, the climate crisis. That's the world that they're going to inherit. Um, there's, a, there's a cartoon I like. It's, the, it's about you know, the, the phrase, and the meek shall inherit the earth. And the, the meek are saying, now, would you mind if we inherited Mars instead? Um, the, earth, the earth's pretty messed up. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, it's, uh, we haven't, we have not, again, we have to confess our sin, don't we? And it's an opportunity to think about, okay, we can't fix everything, but I can change my habits, um, about recycling. I can change the amount of water I use. Um, I can do an, a heat inventory in my house and see where I can save energy. It's both smart and it's loving, um, um, and I can, I can um, be, I can take my part in the city councils that, that determine the policies that will affect the poorest of the poor who always suffer the most from our climate decisions here and around the world. And we can also, on a, on a larger level, um, the more, the better we do managing our, our trash, lessening the amount of trash we have and, and managing it, the less we inflict on poor nations around the world who, in order to get our aid, have to take our trash. So uh, this really is a worldwide Anglican communion question, as well as it is a, lo a very local question, something that each one of us has to discern about. And while there's probably no one right size fits all, um, almost all of us could do better in that area, and we need to for the, for the children yet unborn, to use a biblical language. Yeah, thank you for that. Okay, and then you'll be the last one. Okay, please. Mm -hmm. I th thank you for that question in particular. I, I do mean that. I think there is a, um, a pattern of speech and action right now that has to do with the joy of being offended, <laughs> the fun of being offended, um, so that when someone uh, slips and says something they don't mean to say, I get all huffy and, and, and angry. Um, or even if they don't, um, I hear it the wrong way deliberately and get all huffy and angry. Um, and what it, what it does is to make people worried about what they say and what they do. It does it, if, am, I be, am, I, am I saying the, the exact perfect thing? Maybe I better not say anything. It puts a real um, chilling effect as the First Amendment language, but um, we don't have to use a technical term. It just makes people afraid to, to say something or do something because they might do it wrong. So if we say instead look for the person's intention and appreciate what they are trying to do rather than whether they did it perfectly, um, we'll, get, we'll all get a lot farther. <laughs> um, and I think we can all f remember examples of someone that has deliberately misunderstood something that we said or um, just, um, just thought you know, we, we did it in a, some clumsy way. Um, I, Henry Ryder, uh, who used to teach pastoral theology, used to say, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly. <laughs> Instead of if it's worth doing, it's worth doing well. Of course, both are true, but um, there are very few things in this world that have to be done perfectly. And we can give each other some space, a little rope, you know, um, a little room uh, to not be perfect, because if we look in the mirror, we know really that I'm not 
perfect every time and everything I say, everything I do. So it might be okay for you not to be perfect and not, you know, to see what I mean? That's, that's the kind of thing I mean about patience. Um, but I'm sure we can think of other examples. And, and then there was a one more question here. Comment, yeah. Churches, other, many other nonprofits are reliant on volunteers, but they also they have a mission that is thought out and organized. All the volunteers' gifts may not uh, support a mission, or how do you, how do you organize and, and not stifle you know, this energy, but you know, keep them on mission? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, the recognition that, 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 that a church has a reason for existing. It isn't just a club. We're, we're focused on proclaiming the word of God and, and uh, offering pastoral care to one another and to the, those around us, and the, the, the net is wide. We're trying to do that not just in a narrow way, but in a, in a, we're trying to think big, and all those, and some of these skills are really very important to cultivate in the community. But then there are other skills that may not be on mission. Um, so suppose a, a, a young member of the congregation um, it beca it becomes really interested in playing the guitar, um, and we don't really have a, a, a music service that fits that. We can either cultivate one temporarily until that person is in, it goes on to college and, and whatever, or uh, we can find a place um, that, that becomes an, an extension of the church where that gift can be used and recognized. We can, we can bless gifts that are not immediately useful to the church. Um, and we can support, uh, because what it does, I think, is to give remind everybody to give a kind of creative energy um, that where people are really free to, to explore the gifts that God has given them. Thank you. Thank you for all these questions and comments. Thank you for listening so carefully and for thinking with me about this, these questions. And thanks again for welcoming me here.